Open your Bibles, if you will, to the 103rd Psalm. Um, you know, whenever you're, you're, if you're teaching on certain subjects, you're going to go over sometimes the same scriptures over and over again because those are the foundational scriptures of those things. Uh, it's like trying to say you can't preach John 3.16 when you're preaching on salvation more than once. You know, well, you can only use that scripture once. You're teaching on salvation. You can use it every time. Amen. Hallelujah, or, or, or Romans, the third chapter, you know, the 23rd verse, amen. You know, if you're going to teach on salvation, it's kind of hard not to use John 3.16 or Romans 3.23, amen. amen. Just kind of hard not to, well, if you're going to teach on healing, you're going to run over some of the same scriptures over and over again. Amen. And so, uh, don't, you know, don't go, oh, he's using the same scripture. Wait, well, how can you not? Those are foundation scriptures to the very text of, of what we're talking about. Amen. amen. So, Psalm 103, verse 1 through, uh, we'll go down through verse 5. It says, Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. Oh, thank God. Hallelujah. You've taken time to bless the name of the Lord, to honor him. Amen. Amen. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not. Everybody say, forget not. Forget all not. his benefits. Oh, glory to God. <laughs> I'm glad I came into a kingdom where there's benefits, Amen. not repercussions. Yeah, really. Amen. Satan's kingdom has repercussions. God's kingdom has benefits. Can you say amen? amen. Hallelujah. Who forgiveth? Y'all always quote this? <laughs> Who forgiveth all thine iniquities? Who healeth all thy diseases, who redeemeth thy life from destruction, who crowneth thee with loving kindness and tender mercies, who satisfieth thy mouth with good things, so that thy youth is renewed like the eagles. <laughs> Glory! Well, let's go home. That right there is enough to bless you for the rest of the week. Yeah. Uh, that's enough to, God, I mean, that's enough to put you over the top under any circumstances, isn't it? Yeah. Praise God. Oh, thank God. David had learned. So remember we read David a little while back and said, I was young and now I'm old and I've not yet seen the righteous forsaken nor the seed begging for bread. Can you say amen? amen. David wrote, I mean, a lot of his songs were written out of his life experiences. Actually, most of his songs were written out. All of his psalms were written out of his life experience. They came from something he was dealing with or going through or facing or a victory he had won. Something David had gone through, he wrote a psalm about it. Yeah. Amen. And they became the songbook of the church. Now, I know he's not the only psalmist, but he was the primary psalmist that we have in the book of Psalms. And it became the songbook of the nation of Israel, which was the church basically at that time. Hallelujah. And why? Because they constantly reminded them of who God is and what God will do and what God has in store for us. Amen. 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 And so he says, bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that's within me. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not. Yeah. Yeah. Forget not all his benefits. So praise God, there was an encouragement. There was, a, there was an instruction. There was a mandate from the psalmist to not forget something, the benefits of God. And then he goes on to begin to list them. And I know we're not reading the whole, the whole psalm, but there's, these, these first few verses here are good enough. <clears throat> Who forgiveth all thine iniquities. Oh, thank God, sin has met its match in Jesus Christ. Amen. Hallelujah. Victory over sin has come through a relationship with God through Jesus Christ. Praise God. Thank God that we do overcome. How? By the blood of the Lamb and the word of our testimony. Praise God. Hallelujah. Thank God Jesus shed his blood to empower us to have victory over sin. Amen. Amen. That sin no longer shall have dominion over you. You don't have to bow your need to sin. You don't have to succumb to sin. You don't have to let sin lord it over you. Praise God. You are victorious through Jesus Christ. Somebody shout hallelujah. hallelujah. Amen. And there is not a sin in mankind that the blood of Jesus cannot reach and cleanse and deliver you from. Hallelujah. 
Oh, hallelujah. You know that song, the blood that Jesus shed for me way back on Calvary. Amen. It reaches to the highest mountain. It flows to the lowest valley. Amen. Thank God that Jesus' blood can find you wherever you are and cleanse you and deliver you. Amen. Through, the, through that and the word of our testimony. He forgives all your iniquities. Praise God. And then he goes on and says this, who healeth all thy diseases. Amen. Now, I'm going to tell you something. You can't preach the first half of this verse with, with con conviction and confidence and then turn around and say the second half doesn't apply. Right. Heard people do it. Yeah. Heard them do it. God forgives all your iniquities. He, you know, he'll, kill the, he'll deliver the prostitute. He'll deliver the drug addict. He'll deliver the pimp. He'll deliver the murderer. He'll deliver the adulteress. He'll deliver the homosexual. He'll deliver and deliver and deliver and he'll set them free. He'll forgive all their iniquities and come over here and go, now you know, it don't always mean he heals all your diseases. Well, well you can't preach it in both halves one, 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 one way or the other. If he, if he forgives all your iniquities, he heals all your diseases. Yeah. Amen. The healing power of God is available through the Word of God. Jesus purchased. I, 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 Dad Hagen used to teach a sermon a number of years ago, and, and he said that he called it this. He called uh, forgiveness and healing God's double cure. Yeah. And if you'll go through the Bible time and time and time again, when Israel got forgiven or when somebody in the church got forgiven, they also got healed. Yeah. Or in some, some cases, if they got healed, they got forgiven. James says, you know, if there's any sick among you, let him call for the elders of the church. And the prayer of faith and the anointing of oil shall save the sick. And if there's any committed any sins, they'll be forgiven him. Amen. The Lord will raise him up. So they pray for him to get healed, and he'll get forgiven at the same time. And in many cases, they got forgiven, they got healed at the same time. Amen. God's, why is that? Why is it that God's healing power is often administered at the same time forgiveness is administered? It is because it's the same sacrifice that procured both at the same time. Jesus, look, look with me if you will. Now we could, we could spend an hour or two here right here in Psalm 103 and it's a good place to spend. But look over in the 53rd chapter of the book of Isaiah. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Now, if you want to, let's really kind of just back up in the chapter 52, verse 13, and we'll move down into 53. Make sure you understand we're talking about Jesus. It said, Behold, my servant shall deal prudently. He shall uh, be exalted and extolled and be very high. As many as were astonished at, it, at thee, his visage was so marred more than any man, and his form more than the sons of men. So shall he sprinkle many nations. The kings shall shut their mouths of him, for that which had not been told uh, them shall they see, and that which they had not heard they shall consider. Verse 1 of 53, continuing on. I don't know why they stuck 53 in the middle of this. Should have stuck it up there back verse in the previous chapter, you know, before the 12th verse. Who hath believed our report? And to whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? For he shall grow up before him as a tender plant and as a root out of dry ground. He hath no form nor comeliness. Um, and, we and when we shall see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. This simply says Jesus will not come in a way that he's charismatic and you just like the way he looks. I mean, listen, we are so image conscious in the world today, it is ridiculous. Me and Nathan have had these discussions because uh, we talk about singing. You know, if you, if you go back and listen to music um, from the 50s and 60s, especially, the harmony and the vocal talent of people was extraordinary. Today, if they look good, they'll hide the vocal inabilities. Nathan said, yeah, they'll, they'll, that, what they call the auto, what, auto something, their voice. They'll, they'll actually on the soundboards re-EQ re their voices to hit notes they can't hit because they can't sing. But they can dance or they're pretty. And usually, you know, they don't want no ugly dancers, so they want pretty dancers. And they, and they cheat. And because, why? Because man is so image conscious. How many know this? John F. Kennedy won the presidency because of the television debates. Every person, the polls rather, everybody that heard the debates between Kennedy and Nixon in 1960 on the radio thought Nixon won hands down. Just hands down. Because Richard Nixon was an extremely intelligent um, politician. Well, not just politician. He was extremely intelligent in world affairs. And he was just, I know, I know y'all, you can think of Watergate, but, you know, forget that. He was, he was brilliant. Nixon was brilliant. But everybody who saw the television debates thought Kennedy won because he was good looking and articulate. And that had began the entire political downfall, voting for people. Because, listen, how many, how many remember when John Edwards ran? 
They picked John Edwards and groomed him because they thought he could be another Kennedy in looks and whatever. And that's why he, he wasn't, he was great. He, 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 ain't, he didn't he serve the Senate. They got him in the Senate so he would have some, some qualifications to run for president. They thought they were going to groom him image-wise for to be the president of the United States. And our whole country is, you know, in, in this nation at least, is image driven. They're driven by looks. They're driven by appeal. I mean, if you're an ugly preacher, you're in trouble. If you can't, if you can't be slick and cool, and, you know, and, and be imaged, people don't want to listen to you. They don't want to see you. They don't want to, you know. I mean, if you've got, you got kind of a southern drawl and, and you, you kind of sound like a hick, you could be anointed enough to raise the dead. They wouldn't care because you, they, they really listen to somebody who's, who's got the image and the polish and don't have an anointing to heal a gnat. That's, what, that's where our country is. That's where our nation is as a general rule. I mean, image drives everything. And, but the Bible says Jesus would have no form nor comeliness nor any beauty we should desire him. He wasn't coming and people weren't going to follow him because of how he looked. He wouldn't, I mean, you wouldn't have, the, you know, uh, you, you wouldn't have women, you know, um, following after Jesus because he was good looking. And people followed after Jesus because of the anointing. Amen. And the Bible makes it clear. He would have no form nor comeliness. He would have no beauty that we would desire him. He would not be an image-driven ministry. He would be an anointed-driven ministry. Amen. He was coming with the power and the purposes of God, not to, to fake people out with a look. Hallelujah. Verse 3, He is despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows, and acquainted with grief. We hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised, and we esteemed him not. Surely he hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. We can, go ahead, we can go ahead and read. Well, let's go ahead and read. But he, um, all we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and he was afflicted. Yet he opened not his mouth. He is brought as a lamb to the slaughter. And as a sheep before her shearers is dumb, so openeth he not his mouth. He was taken from prison and judgment. And who shall declare his to this generation? For he was cut off out of the land of the living. For the transgression of my people he was stricken. He made his grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death. Now the margin says that in the Hebrew it's deaths, plural. And that is accurate. The Hebrew says deaths. Because he hath done no violence, neither with any deceit in his mouth, yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He hath put him to grief. When thou, sh when? When thou shalt make his soul an offering for sin, he shall see his seed, he shall prolong his days, he, and the ple pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. He shall see the travail of his soul, and shall be satisfied by his knowledge. Shall my righteous servant justify many, for he shall bear their iniquities. Therefore will I divide a portion with the great, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he poured out his soul unto death, and he was numbered with the transgressors. And he bare the sin of many and made intercession for the transgressors. Okay. So we have the 53rd chapter of the book of Isaiah tied in with the 52nd chapter. Let's back up to verse 3. It says, He is despised and rejected of me and a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. Now, I know you've been told this. We're going to do it again. Wow. Well, one thing is we're on the internet and there may be people tuning in or listening to this, this for the very first time in their life and never heard this. So we can't, we can't just assume that everybody that we're communicating with has heard this before. All right. Now, the King James uses the word a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. The word sorrows comes from the Hebrew makab. And I'm, I'm, I'm sure I'm not pronouncing it great or properly. Uh, a Hebrew, I'm, I'm not a Hebrew scholar, but I can do some study and find things out. But um, it, it comes from makab, M-A-K-O-B, is the trans translation of it from the Hebrew alphabet into the English. And it means grief, pain, or sorrow. <clears throat> so he's a man of grief. Really, I, it's I, I, you know, sometimes King James translators use words, you wonder why they use a certain word, but this word means, first translation is grief. Then it says, and he was acquainted with grief. This comes from koile, C-H-O-I-L-Y. Again, the Hebrew word, uh, transliteral, transliteral translation of the letters from the he Hebrew into the English lettering. And it means disease, grief or sickness. Now, that's out of the Strong's, of course. Brown, Driver, and Big simply translates it sickness. 
It doesn't have any other translations for this word, only sickness for this word. And so, uh, when you read it this way, you say he was a man of grief and acquainted with sickness. And then verse 4 says, surely he, was, he, he hath borne our sicknesses and carried our griefs. Hallelujah. Amen. And then it talks about in verse 10, yet it pleased the Lord to, uh, uh, to put him to sickness, to make him sick. One translation actually says, to make him sick. It pleased the Lord to make him sick. How to, when thou shalt make a soul an offering for sin. At the same time that Jesus was being made sin for us, he was being made sick. He carried not, all, and if you read this, you'll see, he carried the, the anguish of the soul. He carried the uh, sin of the spirit, and he carried the diseases of the body. Jesus was the complete sacrifice. Jesus carried it all. Jesus paid the price for it all. Amen. Amen. Jesus doesn't want you sick any more than he wants you to sin. <clears throat> now, I know people come up with dumb statements. You know, God made prostitutes. So he could say, oh, just shut up. God didn't make a woman a prostitute. She chose that. Then God didn't make a man a pimp. He chose that. Are you here? Didn't make you a mur any more than he made you a murderer. Are y'all here? You're going home. People come up with some of the dumbest stuff and then blame it all on God. No, God's not for sin. Sin is anti-God. It's not of God. Are you here? God is good. Everybody say, God is good. How often is God good? All the time. Hallelujah. But here we begin to get a glimpse of how that God intended to redeem mankind, not only from spiritual, a spiritual state of separation from him, but to deliver his body from the effects of man's sin in the garden. When, that man did not know sickness until sin entered into the picture. Sin, sickness, therefore, is the evil offspring of its parent, sin. Now, let me say this. This is why when they found the man born blind, the disciples asked him because the Jews believed that when somebody was sick, it was a, a result, a direct connection to a committed sin. No, sickness came into the earth because of sin. It has a direct connection to sin, but not necessarily individual. It can, but not necessarily. Diseases are in the earth because of the fall of man. Man's body is susceptible to bacteria and viruses and, um, you know, uh, different things because of sin in the earth. It's a fallen world. Man was not sick in the garden until he committed sin. We don't have any record of anybody being sick until after the fall. People didn't die before the fall. And you got people coming along. How are they going to die if they don't get sick? The way they did in the Old Testament. Call the kids in, line them up, lay hands on them, curse them, bless them according to how they're living, lay your feet on the bed, throw your feet up and go home. Hallelujah. Go in, go in the mountain, tell Joshua I can't go in and get taken away. Amen. Walk with God and be not. Amen. Methuselah walked with God and was not. <laughs> Hallelujah. Did I say Methuselah? Enoch. I don't know why I said Methuselah. Methuselah was the oldest man. Enoch just walked with God and was not. I guess really technically Enoch would be the oldest guy because he didn't die. <laughs> Hallelujah. He just walked with God and was not. Amen. Just walked with God and was not. You don't have to get sick to die. You just go home. Pack it up and go. Amen. But here it tells us that at the same time that Jesus was being made the sacrifice of sin, the sacrifice for humanity, he was also being made the sacrifice for our physical health. Thank God. Now, we do know from the New Testament that we don't get our glorified bodies until the return of Jesus Christ. We don't get the incorruptible, immortal bodies until Jesus comes back. We will eventually die. Amen. If Jesus doesn't come back, you'll eventually die. But you know what? You don't have to die sick. You can just go home. Pack it up and take off. Hallelujah. Now, so this is an Old Testament reference. Look over into the... Um, I believe it's the 15th chapter of the book of Exodus. God had given commandment to the people to 
In verse 26, it says here, If thou wilt diligently hearken to the voice of the Lord thy God, and wilt do that which is right in his sight, and give ear to his commandment, keep all his statutes. Now, here the, Hebrew, the King James says, I will put none of these diseases upon uh, which I have brought upon the Egyptians. And really, if you'll study this, um, the tense of the verb used here is not causative, but permissive. In other words, they came, they, they were, they came on them. I won't allow these things to come on you like they came on the Egyptians. God didn't make people sick. They were there. As a, you know, they, you know, let me tell you something now. You go out in the middle of the winter in shorts and, and no shirt and run around the snow and, you know, whatever and or whatever, and you come back in and you've got sniffles and all that kind of stuff. God didn't make you sick. You did it to yourself, bozo. Hello? Or you go, go, go hanging around people and getting all up in their face and not, not using any brains. You can get yourself in trouble just by being dumb. Jump off a building and break an arm. Well, the Lord will help me. Well, Jesus didn't do it. Jesus said that's, not, that's tempting God. See, we, we get these ideas about stuff. Well, if the Lord were really protected, you could jump off that building and not get hurt. Well, Jesus wouldn't do it, and he's God. He said it was a temptation of God to try to jump off the top of the temple and expect angels to catch you. How many people tried to walk? That don't, don't raise your hand. How many people, since you got saved, tried to walk on water? Try to prove you had faith. I know people did it. I know people. <laughs> But they demonstrated the lack of faith to start with. They wore the swim trunks. Anyway, <laughs> if you really believe you're going to walk on water, you would just wore your regular clothes. <laughs> just in case. They did it just in case. See, faith doesn't have just in cases. <laughs> Hallelujah. <clears throat> but what I'm really after is the very last phrase of this verse. For I am... The Lord that healeth thee. Again, if you'll notice in your Bible, at least in King James and in many other translations, the word Lord is in what they call small caps. This is a translation. This is how they translated the four Hebrew letters of the unpronounceable name of God, Y-H-W-H. Now, the Germans back, I don't know, 1500s, some middle era of Middle Ages, took and put some vowels in there, changed the Y to a J, and the name became Jehovah. And we often use that. You'll hear that name Jehovah all the time. And, and it refer, but really, Jehovah is, is, is a added or, or an attempt to pronounce the unpronounceable name of God, Y-H-W-H. Now, let me say something. It had to have been pronounceable at one time. It's just that the Jews got to where they wouldn't pronounce it for so long, they forgot how it was, how it was stated. Okay? You'll hear some more modern people, in, you know, in the, in about the, around the 70s or whatever, people started taking YHWH, adding an A and an E in there and using the term Yahweh. Now, Yahweh and Jehovah come from the same Hebrew word, YHWH. In your Bibles, it'll be in small caps. Wherever you see that, that is those letters of YHWH, okay? It is Je Jehovah, Yahweh, or YHWH. It is the covenant name of God. It is, it, it, Schofield says something very interesting in his, his uh, notes on Jehovah or, or, or YHWH, Yahweh. The, listen, which one you want me to use, guys? I'll, I'll just say Jehovah. But it, you understand when I say that, Yahweh, Y A W H E, Yahweh, Y A W E H, is that how it is? Y, okay. Or Y H, Y, <laughs> y H W H, okay? Yahweh. Jehovah, or Lord in small caps, all come from the same thing, meaning the express covenant name of God. God entered into covenant with his people with that name. Okay? It is a covenant name between God and his people. And then there are progressive self-revelations of his covenant name through what we call the hyphenated names. We have um, Jehovah Jireh, the Lord will make provision. We have Jehovah Tzidkenu, the Lord our righteousness. We have Jehovah Shalom, the Lord our peace. Amen. We have Jehovah Nisi, the Lord our banner of victory over us. And Schofield discusses all of these in his notes. Okay? But the very first one that was hyphenated is found right here. What your his righteousness? What in his peace? What in his victory? Amen. Are you here? 
The very first compound covenant name of God that he gave to his people was Jehovah Rapha. The covenant keeping God who heals your body. The Lord that physician. Here it says in, in King James, the Lord that healeth thee. It's also translated the Lord that physician. It is, but you understand, again, we're talking about Jehovah. We're talking about the, the distinct covenant name of God. This is an act of covenant. God proclaims himself in his covenant with his people as the God of health. Not the God of sickness, but the God of health. Now, if you're outside the covenant, there's some different story there. Jesus told the Syrophoenician woman, I'm sorry, but the woman who came and begged after him, he said, it's not me. Remember, her daughter was grievously vexed with the devil. This woman came and called after him, and she said, Master, my daughter is grievously vexed with the devil. And, and, and he turned to her and said, what would you have me do? She said, well, I want you to come heal her. He said, it's not right or me to take the children's bread. What covenant? And give it to the dogs. She was out of covenant with God. She didn't have a covenant right to it. How did she get it? By faith. She said, yes, a little bit. Of, even the dogs get the crumbs from the master's table. He said, woman, great is your faith. Be it unto you, even as thou wilt. And her daughter was healed in the selfsame hour. But the point of that is, here, there's two points here. One is, she got into it. She got into covenant blessings by faith that she didn't even have a right to. And the other one is, she wanted something called help, the healing deliverance for her daughter, and he called it children's bread. It belonged to the kids. It's just bread to them. It was a covenant right. Well, that's Israel. I am the Lord, and I change not. God revealed himself in covenant to his people as the God of health. And then he goes into Hebrews, the... Um, Eighth, and I, I actually, folks, I am not using notes. So you just have to bear with me while I go find stuff here. Why aren't you using notes? Because I'm following the Holy Ghost. <laughs> Amen. Hebrews chapter 8, verse 6, But now he hath obtained a more excellent ministry, but how much more he's the mediator of a better covenant established upon better promises. Now, the God of the first covenant revealed himself as the God of health and healing. I have a hard time believing, and he also said, I'm the Lord, I change not. Why did he reveal himself that way? It was only a revelation of who he already was. When he revealed himself as Jehovah Shalom, it was only a revelation to the people of who he already was. He didn't become our, the God of peace when he said that. He already was. He just let them in on it. Amen. He didn't become the God who makes provision when he went, you know, at the well when they built the, built the, the uh, memorial to God and named that place Jehovah Jireh, the Lord provides. The Lord is our, when, remember when Abraham was going to offer Isaac. God did not reveal himself at the time of, of provider and become provider at that moment. He was already provider. Do you understand what I'm saying? When they got the revelation, when it was revealed to the people, the character and the nature of who God is or was and is, it wasn't that at that moment he became that. He'd already been that. They just found out. Amen. Now, how many of you ever played video games? Now, you get to certain levels, you unlock things. But I want to tell you something. All those things you unlock were there the whole time. You just found them. You figured out how to get, you, when you opened up something, you saw something you'd never seen before. It'd been there the whole time. Okay, who, don't, who doesn't play video games? But I've seen them play, all right? God was the God of health and healing before he ever told them. Before he ever let them in on it, before he ever gave the name out, I am Jehovah Rapha, the Lord thy physician, the Lord thy healer. He didn't become that in Exodus 15, 26. He already was Jehovah Jireh. He just told him about it. So what am I saying? He says, I am the Lord. I change not. In other words, he is who he is. Y'all get that? He is 
who he is. He said this. Remember when Moses said, who shall I tell Pharaoh has sent me? And God says, you tell them that I am that I am sent you. What do you mean? I am. God is who he is. And he doesn't become something different for different dispensations or different times or different people. God is the great I am that I am. He didn't become Jehovah Jireh or Jehovah, I'm mean, sorry, Jehovah Rapha in Exodus 15, 26. He already was. He just revealed that to them. He revealed another aspect of who he is. Y'all with me? You understand that? So when we come to Hebrews and find out that we have a new covenant, which was established, a, a better covenant, which was established upon better promises, God didn't stop being who God is because we got a better covenant. God's still Jehovah Rapha, the Lord thy physician. Didn't change. He's still your peace. He's still your righteousness. He's still your victory. He's still all the things he is and all the different compound covenant names that there are. He's still all those things. He didn't stop. Jehovah Ramah, I believe Jehovah Rama, uh, the Lord is there. He's present. Oh. We don't say anything about the New Testament. Have you heard, not heard Jesus? So think of some of the compound covenant names of God and then think of things Jesus said. The Lord is present. When Jehovah Ram, I believe that's Jehovah Rama. Jesus said, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. Jehovah Shalom, the Lord is your peace. Jesus said, peace I give it to you, not as the world giveth, but I give it unto you. Amen. Are you here? You're going home. So you start seeing that we start seeing in different terminology, maybe, but describing the same thing: the character of God of what it means to be in a covenant relationship with Him. He has not changed. <clears throat> when you read the Bible, you find out from the Gospels that the Bible says Jesus went round about their villages, healing the sick, preaching, or actually preaching the gospel of the kingdom, teaching, all, teaching, preaching. I'm going to just really paraphrase it now. He went teaching, preaching, and healing. And then you get over to Hebrews and it says Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, Hebrews 13, 8. He, same yesterday, today, and forever. Why? Because he's God. And God says, I'm the Lord that changes not. You have actually got people who believe that Jesus healed the sick in their ministry and now he's making people sick today. He said he doesn't change. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. Find me one biblical evidence, one story in one gospel, one account in one gospel that he went to someone that was perfectly well and made him sick. And I'll never preach healing again as long as I live. Find one. Uno. Uh. Get French, English, and Spanish. That's three. Uh, if you could, if you say that, in, say those three languages, you communicate with ninety percent of the world's population. Find me one uno uh, example of Jesus making someone sick instead of healing. Just walking up to some perfectly normal, healthy, healed person and putting something on them, and then say, "I'm teaching you a lesson," and walking off. Find it. Now, down in Texas, they say, I double dog dare you. I'm going to triple dog dare you. I'm going to tell you, go for it, baby. Have at it. Go right ahead on. Because I'm going to still be preaching healing because you ain't going to find it. Excuse me. You will not find it. Got to be a little dignified here, you know. Now, I'm a southern boy. Ain'ts in our vocabulary. Hallelujah. He obtained a more excellent ministry by how much he is a mediator of a better covenant established upon better promises. Think about that. People believe that the covenant, they say, well, the old covenant, God had a covenant of healing, but we're in a new covenant. And he went, whoa, 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 whoa. The covenant name of God where he revealed that he was the healer was simply a revelation of himself. And that's what Scotus says. It, it, the, the, covenant name, the compound covenant names are a progressive self-revelation of who God is. Amen. And we got a whole group of people out there who think Scofield is the Bible writer. And if Scofield said it, that's good enough. 
All right? Well, I want you to know Dr. Schofield said the covenant names were a progressive self-revelation. In other words, God was revealing himself. Think about that. It was a self-revelation of who he is, not what he was becoming. God wasn't progressively becoming something different. He was progressively revealing more of who he is. Now, God, is always, uh, God always exists in the now. He is. I am that I am. Jesus said, I am he who was and is and is to come. He's eternal. God is eternal. God is the healer. Everybody say, God is the healer. God is our healer. He's not our sickness maker. He's our healer. Praise God. And so we come and, and we, we, we find out that God has revealed himself as the Lord, our physician. He is our physician. He is. He's not going to be, not was. He is right now. Amen. Your health and healing. Well, I just don't believe in that healing business. Well, why don't you forget calling it healing business and see what God says about who the healer is. I love the Four Square Church's motto. That's the, this is where they got the name Four Square from. It comes from the four pillars of what they believe. Jesus the Savior, Jesus the Healer, Jesus the Baptizer and the Holy Ghost, and Jesus our soon returning King. And that's just, that's Four Square. That kind of, that's kind of get you, uh, you know, what they call Four Squares of the Day or Three Squares of the Day, but you got Four Squares of the Four Square Church. Jesus is our Savior. Yes, He is. He is our Healer. Yes, He is. He's our Baptizer in the Holy Ghost. Yes, He is. And He's our soon returning King. Hallelujah. Those are, they, you can build a house on that. You can build a, you can build a spiritual life, of, of, of solid spiritual life on those four pillars. Amen? Amen. Hallelujah. The, the Muslims have five pillars of faith. We just, have, we just need four. Jesus is our Savior. Jesus is our healer. Jesus is our baptizer in the Holy Ghost. And Jesus is our soon returning king. That'll get you going. Amen. It'll get you out of hell. It'll get you power and, and anointed to serve God. Amen. 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 So, and keep you well while you're doing it, and then keep your eye to the sky while you're, while you're working for him. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Praise God. Now, so, when we understand that God has made himself a revelation to the church, when God made himself a revelation to the church as our physician, one-third of the ministry of Jesus was healing. He taught, he preached, and he healed. That's a, I mean, that's a large part of his ministry. He, everywhere he went, he was healing the sick. <clears throat> when the disciples picked up where Jesus left off, guess what they were doing? Healing the sick. Philip went down to Samaria and preached Christ, and they had miracle signs and wonders. There was one city Peter was in. They brought him out just so his shadow would fall. And when his shadow fell on him, they got healed. Glory to God. Throughout the book of Acts, healings take place all through the book of Acts. Then somebody got together one day, and the devil was the master of that convention. And they said, healing passed away the day the last apostle died. Well, then, then, then what, what? You mean some man dying caused God to stop being who he is? Hello? Y'all hear you going home? God doesn't heal anymore because we have the canon Nazi of Scripture. You mean to tell me we got the whole Bible put together and God stopped being who he is? So that, what you're telling me is in the Old Covenant, once they got the whole canon of the Old Covenant together, God stopped healing folk. Yeah, that's right. That's exactly right. Nobody got healed under the Old Covenant after they got the canon together. Then you, you better go read the Gospels because really they're the Old Covenant. Until Jesus is crucified and raised from the dead, everything up to that was operating under the Old Covenant. Every healing that took place in the ministry of Jesus before he went to the cross was an Old Covenant healing. People got healed under the Old Covenant, even after they had the canon in the Scripture. As a matter of fact, think about the, the, the uh, lepers who came to Jesus. Remember the ten lepers? Remember those guys showed up with Jesus? And he never wanted to know what they wanted. They said they wanted to be, uh, they wanted to be healed. He said, listen, listen to what he said. He said, go your way, go to the priest, and offer the offering, and show yourselves as the law of Moses. There was healing in the law of Moses. Yeah. As the law of Moses commanded. And they turned and went away, and one of them looked and saw he was healed and came back to worship Jesus. See, they were on their way to go show, them, show themselves to the priest as according to the law of Moses for their cleansing, they were healed. 
There was healing provided for them under the old covenant. Now, why did they get it? Well, people didn't, didn't same reason they don't today. They don't believe. That was never big. Hello? What, what did Jesus upbraid the disciples for, or the people for? There's two, there's two things that marveled Jesus throughout his ministry. One was the centurion. He said I, he marveled because he had not found so great a faith. No, not in all Israel. What? He had faith for something he didn't have a right to. He's a Roman centurion. He didn't have a right to get his servant healed, but he got it by faith because he understood authority. Then the second thing marveled was when they didn't believe anything he preached and didn't get anything out of him, he marveled because of their unbelief. The covenant people weren't getting things from God because they didn't believe. And let me tell you something. There are, the God still has the same thing going on. There's marveling in heaven over the people of God and their unbelief and people who are outside of the things of God getting stuff in certain services, certain miracle services because they, they exercised some faith and, and got into something and got healed or whatever and God marvels because they're, they're, they're tapping into something that the covenant people have a right to and they're not getting. He marvels at unbelief. Marvel. Don't be someone who makes Jesus or God the Father marvel because of your unbelief. That went ever big. Y'all hear you're going home. Look with me, if you will, over into the uh, book of 1 Peter chapter 2. And we're going to wrap it up here, and then we're going to pray for the sick. Um, if you've got any prayer calls, please bring them up as we, as we wrap up here. Glory to God. 1 Peter chapter 2. Looking down... In verse 22, it says, Who did no sin, neither was guile found in his mouth. Who went, now, it didn't say he didn't become sin. It said he did no sin. Jesus did not commit acts of sin. He became sin for us who knew no sin. Okay, there's a difference between committing sin and letting sin be, becoming sin to be, be the sacrifice. Who, when he was reviled, reviled not again. When he was, um, when, and when he suffered, he threatened not. He committed himself to him that judges righteously. Who his own self bear our sin sins in his body on the tree that we be in dead to sin shall live unto righteousness. Stop here. What's he talking about? He's talking about becoming sin for us who knew no sin. He is the sin sacrifice. Amen? Look at the rest of it. By whose stripes ye were healed. Oh yeah, preacher. I want you to know that I was talking about the spiritual sin, spiritual sickness of sin. No, it's not. Oh yes, it is. Who told you that? My preacher. Well, he's wrong. I said he's wrong. Well, prove it. I'm uh, glad you asked. Look over Matthew chapter 8. Look down at verse 16 and 17. When Eden was come, they brought unto him many that were possessed with devils, and he cast out the spirits with his word, and healed all that were sick. That it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by Isaiah the prophet, saying, Himself took our infirmities and bare our sicknesses. Was well, not 1 Peter 2 24, by his stripes that you were healed, a direct quote of Isaiah 53? Amen. By his stripes we are healed. Why? One's present tense, one's past tense. Why? Because one's looking to the cross, one's looking back at the cross. In other words, one's prophecy of, of a coming event, Peter is accounting has already taken place. He's bore our sicknesses. By his stripes were healed. Matthew says that he, he fulfilled, when he healed the sick, he was fulfilling Isaiah's prophecy. You can't come along later and change it. Sorry. Makes you wrong. I'm not trying to be right to be right. I'm trying to make a point. You've got to stop listening to people who explain away things from the Bible when they're not making sense. Healing was only for the Jews. Then why do, we, why do they call the covenant we have a better covenant on better promises? And besides that, God, God is who he is. He didn't change being who he is. He didn't become something else. My brain can't wrap around some of the dumb theological things people have come up with. I'll be just quite honest with you. How can you go from one covenant, and the Bible talks about it being, you know, Hebrews uh, over there, who are in Hebrews um, 9, 8. It talks about if the first had been faultless, there'd be no need for a new one, yada, yada. It goes on and talks about you know, those fallacies in the old. My brain can't get around 
God being the God of health under the old, and that's who God is. It was He did not become the God of health just because he was in the covenant with Israel. It's, it's, it's a progressive self-revelation of who he is. And we see in the ministry of Jesus, people healing, people be healed, people healed, people healed, people healed. And Jesus making this statement, I came not to do my will, but the will of him that sent me over in John's, over that great passage in John. You get John chapters 14 through 17, 18. Uh, I mean, what a wonderful passage of Scripture. Jesus said, I came not to do my will, but the will of him that sent me. I, and then he says this, I only do those things which I see my Father do. What did Jesus say? Well, uh, real quick, let me, look, let me find something real quick. Hallelujah. Hebrews chapter 1, verse 3. Hmm. Well, let's start in verse 1. God, who at sundry times and endeavors or different manners spake in time past unto the fathers, or our forefathers, really, which you would be saying there, by the prophets, hath in these last days spoken unto us by his Son, whom he appointed heir of all things, by whom he also made the worlds, who being the brightness of his glory, and the express image of his person. Now stop there. What did Jesus tell Philip when Philip said, show us the Father and it sufficeth us? Jesus said, Philip, have I been with you so long and you don't understand yet? He that's seen me has seen the Father. Hebrews makes this clear. He's the express image of his person. What Jesus did was the will of God. It's who God is. When you saw Jesus in operation, you saw the heart of the Father. You saw the will of God. You saw the desire of the Father in operation. Glory to God. The Hebrew says he was the express image of his person. He was an absolute reflection of the will of God. Jesus, the express image and revelation of the will of God. John said in the conclusion of his gospel, he said if everything Jesus did was written down, he supposed the world itself couldn't contain the volumes of books of the things he did. <laughs> Hallelujah. For those who can't see that, I sat on my son's uh, pedal box. It should be over there with him next door. Anyway, because that's where he is with his guitar. <laughs> Hallelujah. Amen. Jesus is the express image of God. And then Hebrews 13, 8 comes along and says this. Hallelujah. It doesn't matter when the last apostle died. It doesn't matter when they got the Canonasia scriptures. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Glory to God. Amen. Hallelujah. What's he saying? The express image of his person we have a record of. He's still the same today. And he will be tomorrow. And he'll be the next day. And he'll be every day after that. Glory to God. He will not change because he can't change. This because it's who he is. It's who he is. Amen. Jesus Christ is saying yesterday, today, and forever parallels the statement, I am the Lord. I change not. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. God stopped healing when they got the cannon. Jesus can't change just because a bunch of guys got together and said, Stamp, Bible, this is the Bible. Jesus can't change because John came out and goes, Lord, I'm coming home. Oh, I'm, I'm, I'm coming home. 
and that leaves and dies and goes to heaven. And the Lord says, okay, we can't heal anymore. John's come home. I want you to know, Jesus was the healer before, during, and after John. Because God is Jehovah Rapha. God didn't change. God even sent his son in the likeness of sinful flesh to demonstrate who he is to his people. Hallelujah. Jesus couldn't even get any sleep because so many people were coming out to get healed. Glory to God. I said glory to God. The woman with the issue of blood was laying in bed when she heard of Jesus came in the press behind for she kept on, she said, and kept on saying, the Greek says, if I can touch him, I'll be whole. If I touch him, I'll be whole. If I can touch him, I'll be whole. What happened? She got a revelation that the great I am that I am was coming through town manifest as Jesus and he was still the same. He hadn't changed. You come in faith, you can get healed. And she did. And so did a lot of other folk. I said, and so did a lot of other folk. Yeah. Yeah. The only place they get in he marveled because of their unbelief. Unbelief stop. It doesn't stop God from being who he is. It stops you from receiving who he is. Right. Unbelief doesn't stop God from being who he is. It stops you from receiving who he right. is. People don't believe in Jesus, don't get saved. He's still the Savior. Just because somebody doesn't get saved doesn't mean he stops being the Savior. Y'all hear you going home. He's still the Savior even if you don't believe it. You just don't get the benefits of it. You can ride by a gas station. You need gas in your car, but if you don't pull in and, and, and put the, the pump in there and, and, and the nozzle in there and fill it up, you don't get the benefits of gas being there. It didn't stop gas from being there. It's still there. Here we have... Jesus declared is that if you want to know what the Father's like, Jesus said, kind of put it in a little, a little bit, maybe a, more, a little less King Jamesy, King Jimmy. I had a friend who came and he listened to me, some me up, um, to my sermons on the internet a few months ago, and he got, he got so tickled because I called the King James the King Jimmy. Oh well. <laughs> and the King Jimmy you know, some of the way the structure of the sentences and stuff is, is very flowery. Elizabethan is. But I'm telling you, Jesus declared, when you're looking at me, you're looking at the Father. Whatever I do is a direct result of it being the will of the Father. You don't have to, you don't have to look at the Father, just look at me. Watch me. Watch me. And you're watching the Father. Wow. Say that backwards. Wow. <laughs> Hallelujah. That's not original. I heard that T.L. Osborne, first time I ever heard it. Dr. Osborne, marvelous minister. Love, love Dr. Osborne. But I'm telling you, if you're struggling with sickness, and some people struggle, I, I, I just don't know if it's God's will to heal me. Well, go look what Jesus did someone that came to him and he wouldn't heal him. 